Well, hello there. I guess since enough of you decided you were going to submit questions for me, I might as well take the time to answer them. It's Q&A video time. <laughs> Alrighty. So thanks to all of you that submitted your questions. Let's see how much fun we can have or how much I can anger somebody. Potentially both. A Vols fan is kicking us off by asking, who should eventually win the title from Le Champion Chris Jericho? The Luchasaurus! The Luchasaurus! What's it going to be, Cody? <laughs> John Moxley? No. Luchasaurus! Luchasaurus! Lucha freaking Saurus! Who will eventually win the title off of Jericho? I don't really know. I'd be hard-pressed to believe that they would go Moxley at this time, but I could be wrong. Um, but it's a really interesting question. Like, you have the kind of this weird thing where Jericho's the champion, the guy that you might have presented as being the closest thing to a threat to him. You already kind of hot shot at that. Are you going to go back to that relatively soon and then just dismiss the whole uh, purpose of the angle from their full gear match so quickly? I don't know. I don't know if there's a huge hurry to get the belt off of him, frankly. Because of the rate viewership numbers already are not great, do you think they're going to get any better if you put the belt immediately on somebody else? I don't think so. I don't think so. Troy the Gamer HD. What is your favorite? There's always got to be one of these wise asses. There's always one. This is the type of crap I would expect out of the brony Kieran Chase. Or out of Mr. Neckbeard Mounty Love Mounty's Corner. But no, it's Troy the Gamer HD. Ask me this crap. What's your favorite Jeff Jarrett match or segment? Chuck Norris Roundhouse Kick, bitch! That's the best! Chuck Norris Karate Kicked his ass! Why? Because he knew Double J was a Memphis mid-card piece of crap, breaking 10,000 guitars, drawing zero damn dimes. That's the best. Doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. He can. Chuck Norris kicked the shit out of him. <laughs> TJ the God 23. Do you remember when Mankind won the belt from The Rock in 99? What was it like watching that? How did you feel when you watched that? Um, January 4th, 1999. That's almost 21 years ago. That was a big moment, man. Mankind was cool as hell. And the fact that they actually put the strap on him, even at the time I was 17 years old, I'm like, yeah, man, that's cool stuff. I, I wasn't as jaded or cynical or as hardcore leaning of a fan as I am clearly now. So it was much different then. And wrestling was also much better back then. So it was a little easier to not be as jaded. And even at that time, I would have to say, like, as, as obvious as it was that Rock was a huge star in the making. It was going to be a franchise player. And you had Austin... It's like, Mankind is one of those dudes, man. It, it was a cool feeling. It was a definite markout moment for sure. Kieran Chase. <sighs> no Double J question this time, though. Good. I'll tell you what. i tell you what. You don't ask me any more Jeff Jarrett questions. I don't ask you any more questions about Ray Lewis and his white suit on that night in Atlanta at the Super Bowl party where it is almost 20 years later. Deal? Good. All right. If you could sit down and have a drink with Al Bundy, what would you talk about? Now, this is a fantastic question. Like, this is the type of manly, masculine question that one man should be asking another man. Not about a favorite moment involving a Memphis mid-card piece of crap, but a hero, a legend, an icon. Hater of the French, like Al Bundy. What would you talk about? Well, what the hell else would you talk about? The nudie bar? Of course! 
the National Organization of Men Against Amazonian Masterhood? Obviously! But most importantly of all, you would talk about Al Bundy scoring four touchdowns in a single game at Polk High. That's what you talk about. Man stuff. Aaron Busby asks a serious question following up on the greatness of the Al Bundy question. After all these times of trying, Kieran actually finally asked another one. Aaron asks, what's the match of the year? You know, for me, it, it's hard this year because I didn't watch as much wrestling as I have in other years. Didn't watch as many shows, didn't watch as many pay-per-views, didn't watch as many matches. So in some ways, it's a little hard for me to say. But based out of the matches I did see, the shows that I did watch, my personal match of the year, for the story leading up to it, the players involved, what it represented, it was Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania. That was my personal match of the year. For me. Does it mean it was the best in terms of the moose sets? And again, to these moves matters and matches matters, folks. Who gives a crap about the comeback in the middle of the match and the moves that you do? Oh, boy. That's the type of crap that's drawn nobody's eyeball. But that match right there, that match meant something. That match represented, you know, the illusion or the hope or the thought that history would change. And we know it's not. We know it's not going to get much better. We know that. But it was that brief period in time, that one moment in time, that you could hope. You could disconnect from reality. And you could pretend. Like times have changed, even though you know they really haven't. So it's Kofi versus Daniel Bryan for the title at WrestleMania. That's my match of the year. Uh, Dave asks, has AEW been a letdown so far? Uh, not for me, because it's not exactly like I was expecting to be gangbusters out of the gate, and I had significant questions about the guys in charge of the show and whether or not they really understood uh, the requirements and demands of booking and writing for weekly television and maintaining angles. You know, I... I'm not that surprised. Get some highlights. You get a lot of spot fest matches I don't give a crap about. Uh, the lack of characters, lack of storytelling. Those things do not surprise me all that much. Mounties Corners ask, If you could only watch one more pay-per-view a year, which one would it be? If I could only watch one more wrestling pay-per-view each year, it would have to be WrestleMania. I guess, in my worst Keith Jackson voice, the granddaddy of them all! Wernity! The granddaddy of them all! Like, that, that's the show of shows. That's, that's WrestleMania. Big things can happen, and big moments happen, and, you know, that will always have an appeal, even if 10 years from now I don't do this anymore, and I don't watch wrestling anymore. I'll probably still always watch WrestleMania every year. So that would have to be the one. Make Wrestling Great Again uh, asks, Do you think TNT should have given TNA the same TV deal that AEW is getting right now, back when TNA was in its glory days, rather than right now with AEW? Oh, man. Sure, you would have liked to have seen them get off of Spike TV and get to a more legitimate network and kind of their downward spiral. That said, if you were TNT, would you really want to do business with Dixie Carter? Would you really want to go into that situation? Nah. Like, even if they had moved networks, it wouldn't have changed the fact that they were a dying breed, a dying company. Um... So I'm happier that TNT was available to pick up a different brand this time. That's just me. Uh, the King asks, could Bray Wyatt's gimmick work in any era? Um, anything before the 80s? Probably not. Maybe, probably not, because the amount of technology you'd have to have in order to make it work. I don't know that it would have come across the right way. Uh, in the 80s, yes. Attitude Era, yes. I think most any other era, it probably would have worked, at least from a WWF or, excuse me, WWS slash WWE standpoint. James Faluca asked, I got a long one, damn it, you. Oh, God, here we go. 
How is Seth Rollins forced worse than Roman Reigns when WWE was willing to turn him heel once the majority of fans started booing him unlike Reigns, who was butchered by crowds and still a babyface? <sighs> then we're going to go with the reactions. Business is even worse with Seth Rollins at the top than it was Roman Reigns. And yet, these, this whole Seth Rollins thing persists. Seth Rollins beat Brock Lesnar clean in 2019 at both WrestleMania and SummerSlam. So he beat him not once, but twice. How many times did Roman Reigns do that? And how many opportunities did he freaking have to have in order to get there? Seth Rollins, who can't draw flies to shit, beat Brock Lesnar twice in the same damn year on back-to-back -back big four pay-per-views. I'm not saying Roman wasn't forced. I never said he wasn't forced. But Rollins doesn't even get the reactions. And with the WWE being in the reaction business, at least they can justify Roman gets bigger reactions. Positive, negative, doesn't matter to them. He gets bigger reactions than Seth Rollins. It's a new version, kind of Special Olympics version, of Cena and Orton. Where Cena gets the larger reactions, gets a little more interest, and Orton's just pounding and forced down your throat. But since he's not Cena, you automatically think he's better because you're a moron! How is Rollins forced? Like, if you can't see this, James... You need your head examined. I hear the same one that'll ask me questions about frickin' Finn Balor in. <laughs> Dolph Ziggler. And you're trying to make excuses and all this other crap. Cut it out. It is focusing on these fucking bingo hall nerds like those guys that you like to sit there and champion. That has helped make the business what the hell it is now. Which is a nerdgasm indie F fest that continues to lose interest and viewership by the month and damn year. Who even started saying that Roman wasn't forced or forced big time? But how in the hell can you sit there and legitimately look at yourself in the mirror and think that Seth Rollins was forced? How dumb do you have to be? How naive do you have to be? Crazy. Thank you, James, for the dumbass question. J Dog 1334. What's the difference between an opinion and an argument? What's the difference between an opinion and an argument? Is there any difference anymore? Everybody has an opinion. We all gotta think we're fucking right. There's no nuance, there's no context, there's no seeing it from the other side, there's nothing. And literally, somebody can disprove what you're saying, such as the How Was Seth Rollins Forced argument by saying he beat Brock Lesnar not once but twice in the same year clean at back-to-back -back Big Four pay-per-views. And it doesn't matter how much logical sense that makes to the vast majority of the viewers. If James does not want to accept that, he's not going to accept that. I will use another example, and I'm not saying that James said it here. But somebody could sit there and tell me that somebody like an Okada is a bigger wrestling star than The Rock. By no damn measurement has Okada, is Okada, or will Okada ever be a bigger star than The Rock. Absolutely zero damn measurements. But if a Dave Meltzer said it, number one, you would believe he would be biased enough of a New Japan loving cup to say that. Two, no matter how many different business metrics you use to show him how ridiculous that statement was, he would still continue to stand by it because his bias is more important than the reality. So I don't know anymore if there is a difference between an opinion and an argument. And is there anything better about new school wrestling compared to old school wrestling? Um, your last question, the one about talking about man crushes, baby, I'm not even going to dignify with an answer. That's what you get for asking that type of crap. I shouldn't even answer the second question that you asked. It's a very fortunate thing that I'm even going to. Anything better about new school wrestling compared to old school wrestling? 
Uh, production values obviously are better. I mean, that, that can't be slept on. Um, the viewing experience, you know, you can sit there and watch it in 1080 high definition. You can watch it in 4K, like, you know, things like that. The technology is better. Um, ooh. <laughs> ooh, you really reach in here. Um, what else is better? Uh, the women aren't viewed as much as sexual objects, which in some cases you could argue maybe isn't the best for business. But just from a decency standpoint, the women are given more of an equivalent opportunity than what they were in previous years and generations. That's not that bad of a thing. Um, other than that, it's not a whole lot that I can think of at the moment. And your last question sucks! Big or long? Will the red light be there for the WrestleMania main event? How bad is it when fans go to WrestleMania? They already can't damn see because the thing that sits over the damn ring with all the lights is shining in everybody's eyes. Now, not only are they not going to be able to see, they're going to potentially have their corneas burned to be permanently blinded. Let's hope to God oh that that light is not on the whole match at WrestleMania. Michael Starcraft, say a lifelong wrestling fan had taken the last two and a half years off watching the show. Would you recommend coming back for a Royal Rumble WrestleMania season? If you're coming back for that and only that, just to kind of touch base and have something to do for a couple months post football season, sure, why not? Other than that, you've been gone two and a half years, you made it this long, brother, you might as well keep on trucking. Keep on trucking. Nick K. What's most important in wrestling? Character Storytelling or selling? Ooh, it's an outstanding question. But I think the other things matter more when the character is great. Because if the character is great, it can overcome some bad storytelling. It can overcome questionable selling. You can have great selling, but if the character doesn't matter, people don't care about the character, then it doesn't matter. The story could be great, in theory, but if the fans ultimately don't care about the character, then it doesn't matter. Characters trump everything. It is about the characters. It is about the characters. And everything, and I mean everything, builds off of that. And James Fork, I'm closing this off. Who should John Cena have his last match against at WrestleMania? He didn't put in there a WrestleMania, but I freaking did. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Because this is important. There is only one match we need at WrestleMania. There is only one match that must be considered for John Cena. There is only one match that is worthy of John Cena. Most importantly of all, there is only one match that is really truly worthy of the main event of WrestleMania. All the damn times that he wrestled this guy, and they never once went one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania. You don't need no stinking titles. This is breakfast club business and backstage politics and pure unadulterated ego. If you can't get down with that, then you absolutely suck. John Cena's final opponent, and it should be at WrestleMania this year, should be Randall Keith Orton. John Cena versus Randy Orton, God as a special guest referee, Triple, excuse me, Shawn Michaels out there ringside as the cross-eyed jockey for the Breakfast Club. Stephanie McMahon comes out because, again, it's Breakfast Club business. It doesn't have to make any damn sense, you idiots. Dave Batista, Batista comes out of the crowd. Daniel Bryan, hell, the Breakfast Club killer. He can make a random appearance. Only so that way, so Cena can hit him with a big, stiff, vicious hey, hey. And then Orton can RKO his ass straight back to ROH. We need it. We want it. We. Me. You. 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 All of you. You know you want it. You know you got to have it. The last match should be John Cena versus Randy Orton. Career match. WrestleMania. That's the main event. Thanks for the questions, guys. I'm out.